hi everyone and welcome to part three of our video series looking at constructivism. In this video we are going to be focusing specifically on social constructivism. And so here we're going to be building off a lot of the principles that we discussed in constructivism. Uh, for example, both being coherence theories of learning. However, social constructivism focuses on phenomenon that the subject-centered constructivism, um, like Piaget's radical constructivism, sets aside as being context or just circumstances. So things like language, school culture, classroom collectives um, are all things we want to consider when we're talking about social constructivism. So here when we talk about social constructivism, we are shifting from individual to social processes. And social constructivism believes that all knowledge is socially constructed. And social constructivism or constructionism, as you'll sometimes hear it called in the literature, um, is usually associated most with the work of Lev Vygotsky. Lev Vygotsky was a psychologist in the Soviet Union. One of my favorite fun facts about him was that he was homeschooled until he was 15. And a lot of people associate with homeschooling with being isolated and not having the best social skills, um, which is, as someone who did homeschooling and brother did homeschooling, that is so not true. But I do find there is a level of irony in this assumption and the fact that the theorist most credited with social constructivism was homeschooled himself. And so Vygotsky's work was on the social roots of learning. And Vygotsky's work discusses how knowledge originates in social interactions and is only later internalized as individual knowing. So put simply, most functions start out between people or interpsychological before they later become part of an individual's thinking or intrapsychological. So learning happens socially before it is internalized. So for example, learning how to talk starts off with children mimicking and parroting their parents. And parents and teachers can also nudge learners to more sophisticated understandings of their world. So while in constructivism, knowing was constructed, Vygotsky would argue that it is co-constructed. And Vygotsky's work arguably provides more direction on how to think about the educator's role in student learning than Piaget. Although our reading by Davis and Sumara this week um, do question how much direct assistance this theory actually provides um, for teachers. However, um, there are some concepts that are, I think, quite handy for us, um, specifically the zone of proximal development and scaffolding. So let's start with zone of proximal development. So zone of proximal development actually initially looked at age-related cognitive child development stages, but it's now used widely in education, including in adult learning. And zone of proximal development is the distance between the actual developmental level, so what someone can do independently right now through problem solving, and the level of potential development with some guidance. So the actual developmental level is what someone can do right now, unassisted, on their own. And I've also seen it described elsewhere in the literature as being the student's comfort zone. And the zone of proximal development is what's too difficult for our learners to do right now unassisted, but with some assistance they can learn how to do this themselves. So what was once the zone of proximal development can become the actual developmental zone. So when we invite our learners to leave the actual developmental level or their comfort zone and enter into the zone of proximal development with our guidance, of course, um, constructive friction is generated. When this gap goes far beyond their zone of proximal development, meaning they can't do the task even with our assistance, or it's too small for them, a destructive friction is generated. So we want to try and strike a good balance here, being mindful of how large this gap is and making sure guidance is provided, whether it's by us or more capable peers. And the process by which we support our learners in this process is called scaffolding. So scaffolding is in short a technique where the more knowledgeable other, such as an educator, um, provides support to the learner. And that level of support and guidance is adjusted, gradually reducing for each task to fit the learner's current performance level. And it's important to note that scaffolding doesn't necessarily have to be provided by a formal educator. It can also be a more advanced peer providing the scaffolding. And it's important to note that zone proximal development and scaffolding sometimes get conflated, even though they are meaningfully different. And one of our focused readings for this week that you had the option of reading um, shares five strategies for scaffolding student learning. Here they're more focused on clinical teaching, but I think a lot of these strategies could be very much applied to other settings. Um, so their first suggestion is modeling. So as educators, we are role models and our learners will imitate our verbal and nonverbal behaviors. So for example, in nursing school, I was constantly watching how my professors and clinical instructors spoke, how they conducted themselves, because at the time I was looking for role models of what it meant to be a nurse. And the first time I taught in the B Ed program, I realized that my teacher candidates were also doing the same thing I did to my nursing professors and my, my TAs and my clinical instructors. 
Um, they were looking at how we talk, how we manage the classroom, how we engage with our learners, um, the teaching strategies we use, even how we handle disruptions in the classroom, because that happens in adult education too. Uh, the second suggestion they give has to do with feedback. So they do suggest using some self-assessment, such as having learners self-grade their assignments and compare that to a grading rubric if you have one. I would also add in peer assessment here. Um, you can do think alouds with your learners to get an idea of their mental process. The authors also suggest comparing students' work to a specific standard to scaffold their learning. So for example, when I am correcting APA, I don't just tell learners that their APA needs work. I try to tell them exactly um, what they need to work on and I give them pretty specific references to things in the APA manual, often providing direct links to APA websites that tell them exactly how to address um, the error that I found. Instructing. We can also scaffold our learners in our instructing. This can include using scaffolded writing assignments. Uh, we can also encourage learners to make personal note cards. This was something we were really encouraged to do when I was in nursing school. Um, so we had note cards that we made for our clinical experiences where we wrote down things, little reminders and things that we might need a bit more support on. Uh, so for example, when I was starting off, it would be things like what was normal vital signs, um, steps for doing a very specific type of patient assessment, medications we were commonly giving, um, lab values I constantly needed to know the normal ranges for. And initially I did rely on these note cards a fair bit, but I could um, independently problem solve with the help of my note cards. But then over time I came to know the content and I could apply this learning to a variety of different patient scenarios. So what was once my zone of proximal development became my actual developmental zone. And I've also seen note cards like this used in math and science as well. Uh, we can also scaffold our learners through questioning. And this can include questions that both assess our learners and questions that are assisting them. We can even use test questions here too. Um, so what did they get wrong? What did they get right? And this can inform how we're scaffolding our learners and what areas we need to scaffold them in. And then cognitive structuring. So this refers to how students are organizing information in their memory for future thinking and for future action. And we can support cognitive structuring through activities like concept mapping. This helps our learners organize their knowledge. And as educators, it gives us some insight into how our learners are thinking. Uh, for example, the words they're choosing to use, the connections that they're highlighting. Um, this is all very useful information for us as well. And unfortunately, Vygotsky passed away in his late 30s um, from tuberculosis. So he never got to see how widespread his ideas would become. And he actually commented near the time of his death that he would die like Moses at the summit having glimpsed the promised land without setting foot in it. His work didn't actually reach the English speaking world until the 1960s, which is why you'll see some of his publications say the, the 1970s, despite him passing away in 1934. And at this time when his work was coming into the English speaking literature, there already was some established social constructivist literature that existed within English. Um, so his work was absorbed into this body of literature. So what are some additional ways we can apply this to teaching in addition to the scaffolding strategies we've discussed? And if we've been talking here, you've probably noticed that there is some overlap with subject-centered constructivisms. Um, a key piece here, however, is that learning originates in relationships. So things like group work are very important here. So educational recommendations informed by Vygotsky's work tend to recommend more project-oriented pro groups and group-based classroom structures. And here also, teaching isn't about imparting knowledge, rather it's about engaging our learners meaningfully in the application and possible extensions of their established knowledge. So as teachers, we want to start off with what our learners know, and rather than merely just telling them something is right or wrong, we want to show them and we want to engage them in this. So what does this mean for our teaching? Well, we have to keep in mind that learning is unfolding through social interactions and group practices. So we want to pick teaching strategies that will enable this. And a lot of the teaching strategies actually we discussed in constructivism can be used here because they do allow for that social interaction and group practice. For example, problem-based learning would fit lovely within um, social constructivism. Other students should also be seen as resources for learning, which we can harness through group work. So we want to give our learners lots of opportunities to interact and explore topics. For example, in our class, we are doing multi-literacy circles to support this. And we can also arrange our classrooms in such a way that it allows for this such as using pod seating where desks are arranged together in groups so our learners can work together and discuss. And here within social constructivism, we can also use peer assessment. And as teachers, we want to consider scaffolding within the zone of proximal development of our learners. So we don't want to aim our efforts below their zone of proximal development, but we also don't want to go way above it either. 
So once again, to reiterate, we are acting as a facilitator of learning. And a final thought that I want to just leave you with here um, on social constructivism to consider is that while group work is important, we want to make sure we're still paying attention to how we structure our group interactions and how we structure the activities that we have them doing. So just because we're putting them into groups doesn't mean that it's a teacherless classroom. Uh, so like the comic that I've shared here on the screen where it says today more group work while I read the paper. So I'm going to leave social constructivism here. And in part four, our final video for uh, constructivisms, I am going to very briefly touch on experiential learning.